All right, so everything we've talked about to date with respect to constitutive modeling is only considered the elastic behavior of the material. Right? So all materials will have some elastic response, all materials, because the elastic response actually has, I mean, all materials that are made of atoms, which as far as I know is every material, because the, the elastic response actually has to do with the frequency of vibrations of the atoms. But so all materials will have at least a little bit of elastic response. And anything beyond that, we typically call inelastic. And a lot of times, if we're talking about metals, we, 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 we actually use the word plastic, plastic flow. Right? But in rocks, it's a little bit hard to use that terminology. So I'm just going to stick with inelastic behavior. So this is anything beyond the elastic response of material. And in this case, this is anything that's not recoverable, right? So remember, the elastic response of the material will always be recovered. In other words, if you, if you apply force to it and you let it go, it, you'll always recover that deformation in the elastic response. So to go beyond that is in the inelastic response. And when we talk about rocks, a lot of times people will use the word failure. I don't like it that much. I don't think it's precise enough uh, to just say when a rock exceeds its elastic limit that it's failed. Because as we'll see with real data, uh, the failure to me implies that there's no strength, right? That, the, that you know, any further deformation can happen with, with no increase in load, right? With no increase in force. And we'll see that, uh, like I said, with real data that uh, rocks under confinement which are, are all of the rocks that we care about, right, uh, can have significant strength beyond their elastic limit. Uh, sometimes the strength can even increase beyond the elastic limit. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think in Zoback's book, when he talks about these models that we'll be talking about uh, for the next one or two class periods at least, um, I think they're under the sort of heading rock failure. So uh, before we talk about rock failure, let's talk about the different types of tests that we do on rock, because this is how we probe the inelastic response of the rocks. And a couple of these you, you've already done. Uh, so everybody's had two labs now, right? So um, one type of test that we common, so you all, you've all done the unconfined compressive strength tests. Uh, or uniaxial load tests. We're not, uh, not going to talk about that. But so the next one would be the the hydrostatic compression test. So in a hydrostatic compression test, you'd hydrostatically confine the sample on the edges. This is usually done with a pressure bath, right? So you, it's placed in a fluid inside a membrane. Uh, that fluid pressure is taken up to some level. In this case, S zero. Okay. And then, um, and the, all the, in this case, in the hydrostatic compression, all the principal stresses are the same. Right? So the the, flu, the the sample is placed in a. I mean, the way they're actually conducted, right, is the the fluid pressure is typically um, around the x the sides of the sample, and then the then there's a load frame that varies the displacement on the top of the sample, and there's a load cell. Um, in the load frame that tells you what the force is, and you can control that force such that it becomes exactly S0 as well, right? so that you have identical pressure on all sides of the sample. So that would be a hydrostatic confinement test. And so um, that's, that's that type of test. Uh, uniaxial compression, uh, I guess we've already talked about talked about that. That's the, the standard test where there's, you know, no confinement on the outside and you, you vary the load axially. Um, triaxial compression. So this is where it's similar uh, to the hydrostatic confinement experiment, except now we're going to let S1 vary independently of the pressure bath. So again, the way these are actually often done is the samples confined in the pressure bath, just like in hydrostatic confinement. But now, the load frame is allowed to um, vary S1 independently of the pressure bath, so that 
you can either, um, and, and often this means that you, uh, S1 is bigger than the other two, right? So the, the vertical stress in this, the way the picture's drawn, the vertical stress is higher than the pressure bath. The pressure bath would apply an equal force to S2 and S3. So those are, those are called triaxial compression tests. Well, uh, hi, yeah, hi, hydrostatic compression, would, is this what you mean, you call it a confined test? Yeah, hydrostatic compression would be where all of them are the same, right? So they're actually conducted in a similar way. Because right? in reality, you have a cylindrical sample placed in a load frame. And then the load frame, the load frame can only apply a force to the top and bottom of the sample, right? The, the exterior force is applied through fluid pressure, right? And in, in a hydrostatic compression, it's just that force applied to the top and bottom is the exact same as the fluid pressure. So if you increase the fluid pressure, you'd increase the, the load frame, right? And these are typically where you would get, like, you'd, at the simultaneous, you, you would measure the volume or the the, um, uh, the volumetric strain, and then this is where you'd get like pressure versus volumetric strain profiles, right? So this is how you'd get the bulk modulus of the material. Uh, so then, you know, the only difference between triaxial compression is now the load frame is allowed to increase beyond the pressure bath, the force on the top. So this is triaxial. Uh, compression, and then you have triaxial extension, and this is a little bit of a misnomer in the way that your tests are actually done. Because, um, you know, if you just look at this, it says that, uh, you know, the, so the, the confining pressures are the same, the pressure bath are equivalent, and they're greater than S3. Right? So extension, to me, Often, you know, my, my thought process when I think of extension is I'm grabbing on something and I'm, and I'm pulling it. Right? It's actually not how these experiments are conducted. These experiments are conducted by essentially starting off with a, with a triaxial compression test. So the pressure, the external pressure and the axial load frame pressure are all increased at the same time, simultaneously. <laughs> So you're, you, you, you confine the sample, right? and then you release S3. Right? So you initially start off with you know, essentially crushing the sample on all sides equally, and then at some point you release S3, which creates an axial extension or tension in the sample. And the sample will usually fail. Uh, it'll fail in tension when you do this. Or, you know, here I'm talking about literal failure, so it'll, one piece will become two or more. Yeah. No, and we're going to see models that, you know, mimic you know, mathematical models that that uh, capture that behavior and mimic this effect. Uh, rocks are very weak in tension, and so uh, this is a way actually to probe the tensile response of the rock under confinement. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it, this is a, I, I took this one. You can blame Zobat for this one, because I just took the picture from the book. And it, yeah, so uh, I mean, S1 is equal to S2, but if you wanted to draw it on the figure, you could just p pick either one. I guess it would have to be, if you want to have a right-handed coordinate system, that would have to be. But yeah, it, it doesn't really matter because they're, they're the same. Uh, and this is just the nature of the, part of this is just the nature in how you practically conduct these experiments. The most practical way to do triaxial extension or compression is to stick the sample in a, in a fluid that you can control the pressure of the fluid. It's very difficult to independently, to have a load frame that you can independently push on all sides of the sample with. It can be done, 
but it's it's very expensive. It's very difficult. It's you know it's a, it just adds a lot of complexity to the screen. And this symbol um, is still fairly complex, but it's not near as complex as a true 3D effect. Yeah. So um, so yeah, this is a way to probe the tensile response of a material that's under axial confinement. And then, you know, the last test, which aren't, is the one that I just said is difficult to do, so therefore they're not done very often, and that would be a true triaxial test. Uh, this is where all of the principal stresses could be varied independently. And again, this is it's difficult to do because it's, uh, you know, you have to have a very complex load frame that can confine the sample on all sides and, and, and then vary the pressure on all sides independently. So those are the type of tests that we do on rocks. You've done some of them in your labs. You'll do more. And you know what, what we learn from those tests are uh, pressure volume responses. Um, often we plot, uh, as we'll see in just a second, we, we, we plot the minimum and maximum, the difference in the minimum and maximum principal stresses, which is a measure of shear. We'll see why that's a measure of shear in just a second. Um, 